Hello, this is David Hardman with the third part of Introduction to Cognitive Psychology, looking this time at the rise of the behaviourist school of psychology. And the story begins really with Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist who won a Nobel Prize for his work into the digestive system. Along the way, though, Pavlov accidentally discovered the phenomenon of classical conditioning. This happened when he was working with uh, dogs in his laboratories and he was interested in the way that dogs would salivate uh, when they were tasting food. However, um, the dogs started to salivate even when they weren't presented with food but at the appearance of the laboratory assistant, the person that would bring them the food. So this actually messed up Pavlov's original studies for a little bit, but he pursued this observation systematically by, for example, sounding a metronome prior to the arrival of food or ringing a bell prior to the arrival of the dog's food. And sure enough, after a series of these trials, the dogs would indeed begin to salivate at these sounds, even when the food itself was not presented. Well, Pavlov's work was conducted during the late 19th century and the early 20th century, and although it wasn't really published until 1927, when Pavlov published a book, his work was known about amongst Western scientists, and one of the first people to pick up on this was John Watson, uh, an American psychologist. And Watson had been extremely critical of psychology up until this point. Uh, he was very much opposed to the structuralist school of psychology. Uh, he thought that introspection was a terrible uh, research method and he thought that many unscientific terms were being used such as uh, sensation which he regarded as poorly defined. And so Watson uh, felt that psychology had completely failed to take its place amongst the natural sci sciences and he wanted to make it more scientific and essentially he argued that we should only focus on the things that we can actually observe so he didn't want us to be talking about the mind at all he didn't want us to be talking about mental events and he was actually uh, quite skeptical about the notion of mental events uh, occurring and in a footnote to a 1913 paper that he published psychology as the behaviorist views it he said that he regarded uh, thinking essentially as subvocal speech or habitual sensory motor action in the larynx the introduction to this paper uh, gives you some kind of flavour of where Watson was coming from and I'll just read that opening paragraph now. So Watson said, Psychology as the behaviourist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behaviour. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviourist, in his efforts to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognises no dividing line between man and brute. The behaviour of man, with all of its refinement and complexity, forms only a part of the behaviourist's total scheme of investigation. So, uh, for Watson then, behaviorism was really taking the ideas of Pavlov and uh, using them to uh, train people in particular ways. And he thought that if you could uh, take uh, children from a e very early age, you could uh, condition them to be pretty much anything that you wanted them to be. And a famous demonstration that uh, Watson used, I mean, he was really sort of going beyond his data here, to be honest, as he himself actually recognised. Um, but a famous demonstration is the Little Albert study conducted in 1920, 
in which a young boy was presented with um, a white rat and if this young child went to uh, stroke or touch the rat then a very very loud noise would be made behind his head and eventually it appeared that uh, little Albert uh, became afraid merely of the sight of this rat. Uh, this particular demonstration actually has been uh, questioned in subsequent years but nonetheless uh, it became at the time a very famous demonstration. A little later uh, Boris Frederick Skinner came on the scene and Skinner had some issues with uh, the traditional concept of behaviorism and he introduced an entire philosophy of science that he called radical behaviorism. Uh, Skinner himself did not deny that uh, mental events occur but he felt that uh, f like Watson um, it was best to focus on purely observable uh, stimuli and responses and uh, there was a danger that if you did talk about mental events then you would be coming up with uh, explanatory uh, fictions as they were called. And Skinner, uh, his, his idea of radical behaviorism was really all about the shaping of behavior through operant conditioning. So operant conditioning is different from classical conditioning and essentially builds upon the work of Thorndike who you may recall uh, developed the, or discovered the law of effect. And with operant conditioning, um, if you're trying to shape someone's behavior or an animal's behavior, if the uh, organism produces the behavior that uh, you want it to, then you give it positive reinforcement, which might either mean giving some overt reward or withholding some kind of negative event that might otherwise occur. If the desired behavior doesn't happen, on the other hand, uh, you apply negative reinforcement, which might mean either overt punishment or the withholding of something positive that otherwise would have been expected. Although it has to be said that Skinner himself um, was very much in favor of uh, reward. Uh, he believed that rewarding uh, or using positive reinforcement was really the most effective way of producing uh, desirable behaviors and Skinner had uh, ambitions essentially to uh, try and produce a better society through the mechanism of radical behaviorism and uh, this ambition was described in a non-fiction book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity and also in a science fiction utopia novel called Walden 2. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about behaviorism and uh, in the next screencast we'll look at uh, the decline of behaviorism and the rise of cognitive psychology.